Welcome to the Hot Cage Podcast presented by CageWall.com. This episode for February 24th, 2013, the day after the largest fight in women's MMA history, Ronda Rousey versus Liz Carmouche. In this episode, the topics we will discuss will include but are not limited to Jose Aldo's refusal to fight Anthony Pettis for the 145-pound belt, Nick Diaz may be pulled from UFC 158, and the results of UFC 157. With all that being said, let me welcome in my tag team partner as always, co-editor of the Hot Cage Daily and co-host of the Hot Cage Podcast, TJ Craig. TJ, how you doing? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, what a great weekend it was, man. We saw some history go down, and and then we see some uh, some other feuds starting to, to develop on the uh, on the backside of that, so I'm interested. I'm ready to go. I agree, and you know, we talk about how it's a big weekend every weekend when the UFC has a, has a fight. Um, there's a lot of big fights coming up. There's a lot of big fights we've talked about recently. But not mo- not a lot of them are, are uh, historical. You know, this one was historical. So uh, we'll get to the particulars of it here in a little bit. But uh, and, and talk about the historical significance of it. First, let's hop right into the flurry and talk about Jose Aldo. He is currently refusing, according to Dana White, to fight Anthony Pettis. Uh, he said through uh, different uh, intermediaries, if you will, that uh, he feels like Anthony Pettis doesn't deserve the fight, which is interesting. Um, so. Uh, what are your thoughts on Jose Aldo's refusal to fight Anthony Pettis? Well, I think uh, this is the way I see it. I don't understand why he's saying he doesn't deserve it because at 155 he deserves a title shot with Ben Henderson. So if he's able to do that, uh, then he should be able to come down and fight Jose Aldo. And then Frankie Edgar did the same thing. So he, he was up there at the 155, dropped down and got his title shot. So what's the difference? There's not really much difference there uh, if everybody remembers. Pettis was the last w, uh, WEC champion coming out when uh, they shut down. So, obviously, he's made his reign to come up. He decided to drop down and wait, and I think he deserves it. Jose Aldo needs to step up. And like you, we said off the air, uh, it's just like Dana White said, do you think if he gave Jose Aldo a chance to go uh, move up and directly to a, a title shot if he deserved it? You know, so it's kind of something to think about. Well, it is interesting. Yeah, like you said, if Aldo moved either up or down, uh, you know, obviously, if Aldo went down to 35, he'd, he'd get an immediate title shot. No one would, you know, no one would have two words to say about it. So, I agree. I think that uh, I, I don't really know what he's doing this for. Uh, maybe he just feels like he has to somehow be, uh, you know, the, the MMA police or something and regulate who, you know, if he wants Joe Silva's job, he could probably have it, but it pays a hell of a lot less. So he should probably stick to doing his own job and let Joe Silva do the matchmaking and just go in there and continue to crush kids like he's been doing, and then just kind of go from there. So, all right, moving on to another subject uh, in terms of title fights. Nick Diaz has one. For how much longer he will have one is is uh, still to be determined. He famously is a very self-destructive individual who likes to uh, take great opportunities that are given to him and uh, destroy them. So uh, current, uh, right now, Dana White said last night in his scrum that Nick Diaz has done everything that he has to do to keep his fight, but... There were three interviews that were scheduled. We talked about this last time. He, he didn't meet with the media like he was supposed to in, in terms of the countdown crew. His brother Nate was supposed to do interviews. Nate hasn't done his yet, but Nick's done his. And uh, he's really just turning the whole process into a pain in the ass. And then his manager, Caesar Gracie, got online uh, on social media and said that he uh, thought Nick could be, should be upgraded for some flights. Or, and Dana White's like, said, you mean to tell me you're not willing to show for uh, – these interviews, but you got the balls to ask me to upgrade your flight. So, tell me your whole thoughts on, uh, or your thoughts on this as a whole, and then whether or not you think we'll see Nick Diaz in the cage fighting GSP at uh, 158. Yeah, the last time I checked, isn't Nick Diaz a fighter? I mean, he, he's not uh, a media subject, is he? Because I, I don't know. I might be wrong. I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe Dana White's trying to get him to do interviews uh, so that he'll have a second job or something. You know, this is the way I look at it. You're not going to cheer as Diaz brothers. You're not going to change them. They are they are who they are. We've always known this. They come to fight, and that's what they're paid to do. And I understand you have some obligations and you need to do it, but there's no need to hype this fight like it needs to be hyped. It's already been hyped up enough. Diaz does, does that on his own just by himself by talking to shit. So they need to back up off of him a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> I do think that he should... <clears throat> He should have to do a little bit, uh, but you're not going to change him. And, and Dana White thinks he's going to be able to change the Diaz brothers. Well, nobody else has done it so far, not even their mom. 
So uh, last time I checked, Dana's not their mom. So let's just keep them in the cage. Let's see the fight and let's move on. Dana White's not their mom, and I. Well, this is where we disagree. Dana, you're right. Dana White's not their mom, but what I do know is that um, Dana White's the president of the UFC. He feels like there's certain things that you got to do to hype a fight. Not that the Diaz brothers have ever had any problems hyping fights, and I understand that. I mean, if he misses the interviews, listen, we've argued about this in the past. If he misses interviews or he makes interviews, they're both you, you get paid either on the front end or the back end. So if he does the interviews, you know, he promotes the fight when they do the UFC countdown. If he misses the interviews, he in a sense promotes the fight by there being some sort of a question as to whether or not he's going to show. So, you know, or, or you know, the fight's being promoted either way. If he doesn't do the interviews, in a weird way, the fight's still being promoted. So you can make an argument either way. He's, he's kind of doing his job. But, you know, whereas Dana White's not his, not his mom, he is his boss. Last time I checked, if you want to be employed by Dana White, you better do what the fuck he says. So, I mean, I, I think sometimes, because Dana's a cool guy, and early on, I would say a couple years ago, these guys, you know, Dana would kind of tread lightly around, you know, because these guys are all alphas, man. They got a lot of testosterone pumping, uh, whether it's illegal or, or legal. <laughs> and uh, so he has to be very careful in the way that he talks to them because he doesn't want to, you know, take a shot at some guy's pride and then lose the guy just because he doesn't want to look bad. But at the same time, Dana White's saying, listen, at the end of the day, I'm Jerry Jones of the Cowboys or Mark Cuban or George Steinbrenner. I run this shit, and if I tell you you got to do a fucking interview, then you have to do a fucking interview. That's how it goes. I'm your boss. You're not mine. So I don't know, man. With that being said, you're right. He's not going to change the Diaz brothers, but, I mean, they got to fucking play ball, right? I mean, yeah, they got to play ball. <clears throat> but, I mean, this has happened in the past. So what, what does he think – what led him on to, to believe that he was going to be able to be different this time? You know, and he said he had the crew following him around for two – Two weeks in California. Well, that was a fucking week too long there, Dana. I mean, come on. <clears throat> let's, uh, you know, let's, we can take what Dana says on the front end, but I'm sure there's a lot of fluff in that too. He likes to feed the media because it helps him promote the fights too. You know what I mean? So it's, he's not coming out and he's not going to be uh, fully, this is how I am. And, you know, I'm dotting my fucking I's and cross my T's and everything I say because he always says that. Don't do that. So, I mean, yeah, they got to play ball, but come on. Uh, you're not going to change them. It's, the fight's promoting itself. Uh, everybody wants to see that fight. So it's going to put asses in seats already. So let's move on. All right, and with that, we'll move on. We'll get to the fight. Uh, it was UFC 157. Again, it was history. Uh, in the making, history was made. The history books were rewritten. Uh, the glass cage, as it were, was shattered by Ronda Rousey and Liz Carmouche. You know, I, the thing I, I think is interesting about this fight is that everybody goes, uh, Ronda Rousey is the first woman to ever fight in the UFC. And I'm like, well, how, how's Liz Carmouche not the first? You know, there's two of them. They have to fight together. So it's like saying, the tango, you know, right? yeah, it's like saying uh, the Packers were the first team ever to play in the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's silly. They had to play somebody. So, um, all right, well, what happened in this fight was what happens in every Ronda Rousey fight. She armbarred her opponent. Liz Carmouche lasted a little bit longer than the rest, but ultimately was armbarred. Uh, at the 449 mark around one, she had 10 more seconds to survive and uh, was unaware of the time and went ahead and tapped out. So uh, talk to me. Tell me about this fight. It's history. Did it live up to the hype going into it? And, and what are your thoughts on the fight as a whole? Oh, man, yeah, it, it definitely lived up to the hype in my book. Uh, listen, Liz Carmouche came out to fight, and, and don't get me wrong, that, that first couple minutes in the fight, man, it looked like Carmouche uh, – was going to pull Uriah Favor and, and get the back and choke her out, man. She had the twist on, she had the choke, and she was she was cranking. I mean, she was cranking. And and uh, fortunately, I mean, round, Ronda uh, got out of it and turned the tide, you know, and got on the ground, and that was over from then. But definitely, man, those, those two women came in. They were brawlers. It looked like a professional fight. It was a professional fight. Uh, I think both of them played their part into it. And I'm glad it's there, and, and let's move on. Let's, let's do some more uh, women's MMA. Man, I love it. Yeah, I think they made a lot of fans last night, and I think that the, uh, the uh, thing that Dana White said that a lot of people had talked about before, I even said it when I was watching the fight, the people I was watching the fight with, what's the irony that Uriah Faber and Liz Carmouche uh, kind of catch shit for looking exactly like each other, and they damn near <laughs> both won their fights with their standing rear naked choke. Dana that said that in the post-fight press conference. I said, like I said, I said it when I was watching the fight, and I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. So, um, 
you know, Rousey came out. She looked like she meant business. And uh, I, I kind of – the thing I learned about Rousey through this process is how badly she wanted MMA or women's MMA in the UFC. And she said she didn't trust anyone to do it but herself, so that's why she was so adamant about it. And, and you know, she came out. She was very focused. And uh, she dispatched of a very game Liz Carmouche. I mean, Liz Carmouche came in there ready to bang, and she got Ronda's uh, – even though Ronda came out like a – you know, like a house on fire, she was, uh, Carmouche was ready, you know, and before you knew it, she had, she had Rousey's back, and she, she put her in a very compromising position, I think there's a lot of girls who probably would have, uh, tapped to that neck crank, and Ronda just, you know, she's got that, uh, she's got, she's got that pride, and she, it wasn't going to happen, there was no way Ronda Rousey was tapping last night, probably under any circumstances, she was going to get her arm, arms broke, or she was going to go to sleep before she tapped. And I think both the girls really stood up. Uh, the person I really feel for this, it, feel for in this entire process in a positive way, is uh, is Liz Carmouche because I really think that if she in fact is the second best fighter in, in the world at uh, 135 pounds for women, then um, this is a great opportunity for her. This is a, a way for her to now make a name for herself. She's always going to be the first woman, uh, one of the first women to ever fight in the UFC. You can never take that away from her. You know, but I just hope for her sake she doesn't turn into somebody that's signing cards at, uh, or signing posters at card shows or, or that. I hope she, she continues being a fighter. And uh, I mean, she's going to continue being a fighter, but I want her to keep the caliber that she's fought at up. And hopefully when, when Misha Tate and uh, Kat Vigano fight, uh, she maybe gets the loser of that fight since obviously Rousey will get the winner. I, it just I, I really want to see really great things come for these two girls. Obviously, Rousey stars on the rise, but I want Carmusha star to continue to rise because of uh, – Really what I think the girls brought, brought to this event. You know, um, now moving forward, there's been talk of uh, the winner of Misha Tate and Kat Zingano fighting uh, Rousey. What do you see? Uh, there's also been some talk of Gina Carano making a comeback. Uh, Dana said that the Cyborg's kind of out. You know, it's, he says this thing's moving forward without her. So uh, what do you see on the horizon for Rousey? What would you like to see? I'd like to see the, the Tate. I mean, if everybody remembers, man, when they were that was in Strike Force, that was – that was it, man. That was some heated discussion face-to-face, head button up on the podium. I mean, these two were getting on it. And uh, and I, that's what I kind of want to see again because that's why I, uh, I kind of want to let everybody else see that, that's MMA fans, that's UFC fans, you know, that there's a fire within. I mean, they're true hardcore competitors. You know, they don't want to lose. Uh, and that's what we saw, like you said, with Liz. She was a game opponent. She came out, and it was just, I mean, it was fight hard and to the death. It was they were leaving it all in the ring, and they did that. Uh, the The thing is, we need they need to get more female 135ers in the UFC, and I think they will. Uh, but for right now, it's going to be in far between uh, until they can pick up that talent. And I think that's where Invicta comes in because they're going to be start shuffling people. Uh, you know, he already reached out to him once with Cyborg, so that's that's kind of starting some talks. You know what I mean? So uh, we might see some Invicta women coming over and and starting to build that up, and then. The sky's the limits from there. Yeah, and it's a lot. So it's a lot more civil. I mean, there was a time when, uh, when uh, Rousey, uh, I'm sorry, when um, Strikeforce fighters were cut. There's, you know, the UFC owned Strikeforce, but yet they Strikeforce hadn't completely dissolved yet. And you saw things like Frank Mir going to Strikeforce, and there was some moving around. I think the Invicta situation is going to be a lot more um, cordial, if you will. And I think that they're going to willingly have fighters go back and forth from here to there. The interesting thing I think about Misha Tate Ronda Rousey fight is that they're kind of on different ends of the spectrum now. You know, at the time, Misha Tate was saying that she didn't think Ronda Rousey deserved a shot. Who's Ronda Rousey? She hasn't earned it yet. Well, now Rousey's the champ. Rousey's the big deal. She's already beaten Tate. You know, Ronda can sit there and say, you know, I already beat Misha once. And, I mean, she can really make, make things hell for a uh, – for me to take. And I um, think she I think, would too. Cause I think so not too. not like each other. Right. So, you know, if, if I was her, I, if I was Rousey, you know, it's just interesting to see that they're both on different sides of the, uh, of the equation. But again, to kind of put a period on the, on this entire, uh, not this entire event, but this fight, you know, the girls delivered, they got in there and they did what they said they were going to do. They put on a hell of a fight, they represented women's MMA. Well, and something that Dana White said, uh, in his scrum was, you know, everybody was saying that Leota Machida and Dan Henderson should have been the main event. And uh, Dana White said, could you imagine if we had Loyola Machida and Dan Harrison the same as the main event, and this is the uh, – that's the fight we would have got out of them, and that's the last fight of the night? He's like, you know, thank God we had the girls in there instead of those two. 
Now, on the subject of Dan Henderson Loader Machine, let's get to their fight. So what it was was it, it was, was a goddamn shame. That's what it was. It was a split decision. Obviously, two judges went for Leona Machida, who was the, uh, the, the ultimate, ultimately the winner. One went for Dan Henderson. Uh, 29-28 is, were, were the scores from all three judges. Uh, talk to me about this fight, and uh, did you score it the way they did? Let me tell you, the only winner that came out of that ring was Machida because the fans lost on that. Dan Henderson lost on that. Dana White lost on that. The UFC lost on that. I, do you want me to keep going? Because I can pull out a list, you know, over here. Because it was, it was, I can't say it was boring. But we have to, we have to look at how Machida fights, right? But usually Machida will engage more. Last night I saw him back up and try to counter, but he continued to back and not charge in at all. Uh, it was disappointing to see. Uh, I wouldn't give him, I don't think he would last another five minutes in the ring with, with Jones. I don't think he deserves it. I'd rather see the Henderson-Jones fight uh, because that would be much more competitive. Uh, it was awful. And no, I did not score it because I think Dan Henderson was the stalker all night, even though Machida caught him a few times. Uh, it just, you know, with ring control, I, I would have had to, I was trying to get, I, I would have gave it to Henderson. That's what I had it. Well, and here's the issue with, with the way Machida fights. Um, you're going to get some slow fights. You're going to get some boring fights. You know, if, if he can't either – if he can't get to the guy or he goes in there with a guy uh, that has an iron chin, then you're going to find yourself in a position where uh, Leona Machida can't finish someone, and Machida's going to fight his fight. I mean, Machida's that guy that he's just so – has such resolve in the way that he fights. He's like a basketball player who'll just dribble – Till the damn clock runs out. If if he feels like he should be dribbling, he doesn't give a shit. He's like, I'm, I'm not shooting because the shot's not there. He just doesn't care. If it's not right, he won't. You know, he won't do it. And it's unfortunate because I like to compare Leona Machida to Floyd Mayweather. You know, they're both counter strikers. Um, they wait for openings, and if the openings never come, then they're in a boring ass fight. So if you're not going to give them anything to work with, they're not going to violate, uh, step out of their game plan to come into your world just to make it an exciting fight. That's just not how they work, man. They're not built that way. They'd rather win and uh, and look ugly than – or, or not, not look ugly necessarily, but they'd rather win and stick to what they believe to be their game plan than um, you know, go outside of it and potentially lose. So um, which let's advance the, the, the discussion now. Uh, well, first I want to talk about the judging. It was Michael Bell, Derek Cleary, and Cecil Peoples. The only one that had it for um, – Dan Henderson and Cecil Peoples. And Cecil Peoples takes a lot of abuse on the internet as being one of the shittier judges there there is. And um, now most of the media scored the fight for Machida. So of all the of all the fairly well known media, the only people that scored it for Henderson were uh, Dave Doyle of MMA Fighting and interestingly enough Adam Martin who was on our podcast the other day. They both had it for Henderson. Pretty much across the board, all the significant media members uh, beyond those two guys scored it for Machida. With um, fight metric actually having it 30 to 27 for Machida, so um, I don't know. I, I kind of uh, I kind of agree with the Machida the Machida ruling, but at the same time, uh, I I don't know that this is the kind of fight that that makes him deserve to have that number one contender slot and be the next in line for John Jones. This is pretty much the it's interesting they would have a shitty fight because this is the fight between the two guys that can't seem to get their shit together to get back in the ring with John Jones or to, or I'm sorry, the cage with John Jones or do the cage with him in the first place. Dan Henderson has had the worst luck with getting these, getting these title fights. You know, he's like uh, the Donovan McNabb of title fights. You know, in terms of the UFC, he goes to a bunch yep. of championship games and never gets the, never gets the Super Bowl. So um, do you think Machida deserves this fight with Jones? No. Well, how about this? I got to see what Gustafson and, and, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, Gustafson does uh, on his next fight because you know if if they come out and put on a good fight, then then you know I'm a, it's somebody different, it's somebody new, and I might have to jump him. Uh, I don't think his performance yesterday uh, proves that he should be uh, should be up there. Uh, he's already been beat once, and not only was he beat, he got choked out standing up. So uh, no, I, I think it just depends on how. Well, the next couple of fights uh, pan out for the light heavyweight. Yeah, I don't know. Like I say, I agree. I don't think that um, he's going to – I mean, 
Joe's is going to go after him. So, you know, he's already fought him once before. So that was that was an interesting fight. I mean, Machida did land some strikes on him. So, you know, if he, if he tightens up his game plan a little bit, cleans up some shit, then maybe he can make it a more interesting fight with, uh, with Joe's moving forward. All right, speaking of uh, former champions, Uriah Faber was in there. He was cleaning up a, a kind of a sticky situation on his resume, which is his fight with Ivan Menjavar. He beat Menjavar uh, many, many moons ago because uh, Ivan illegally struck him. Uh, I think it was some long lines of he threw a kick and Uriah was down still, so he was disqualified. In this fight, uh, he made short work of Mr. Menjavar by rear naked choking him from the back. Again, the joke was made about Faber and Carmouche and the, and the similar look and the similar uh, way their fights went. But uh, Uriah Faber got the, got the standing if you will, uh, rear naked choke on Menjavar, 434 in the in round one. Give me your take on this fight. Uh, Uriah looked good, but it's Ivan Menjavar, so did it. Uh, well, just tell me your take on the fight, and we'll get to the future for uh, Uriah here in a sec. Uh, well, no, I thought he came. You know what? That was kind of the, the killer that we saw back in the WEC. Uh, he, he he got taken down, but on the ground he turned it around and, and used it as ground and pound. And listen, Uriah Faber in that class is probably the best ground and pound uh, individual there is. So and and he uh, he brought in Dwayne Ludwig and, and to his training camp and and team Alpha Male and he's working on some different stuff. But I'm gonna have to say, you know, he had the core rows going last night. He was the California kid. He came out and he wasn't gonna lose. He just he just you had his he was relaxed. He was smiling. Came in the ring and he did what he had to do. And it was uh, to me this is what I tweeted. It was where's that Uriah favor been? Because I remember seeing that kid back in the the, the WEC. Uh, when he was the champ, and, and we saw a little flash of it last night, and uh, I I'm not gonna say he's full back, but I think he's uh, developing some more game, uh, some more game, and uh, I think he'll be right there. He's the number, you know, he's number two, number one contender. Uh, he'll get a shot at it again. You know, and here's what I want to see. Uh, well, I agree with you. He he did look like the Uriah Faber of old. Uh, you know, we we tend to make a make a joke on this podcast, and I've said it in the past. You wonder when these fighters get advanced in age. When they come out to fight in the, you know, uh, when they're 33, 34, 35, 36, am I going to see the Uriah Faber of old or am I going to see the old Uriah Faber? You know, that's what you got to wonder. And last night, like you said, we saw the old, uh, the Uriah Faber of old, and I'm wondering if that's because we saw the old Ivan Menjivar. Um, It's tough. You know, he really wasn't fighting a, a, a monster last night. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about Ivan Menjivar and how long he's been in the game, he was the guy that George St. Pierre fought in the first fight of his career. And it wasn't Ivan Menjivar's first fight. It was George St. Pierre's. It was Ivan Menjivar's fifth fight. So Ivan Menjivar has been around for a minute. He has, you know, he didn't just start fighting yesterday. So, um, as a matter of fact, he didn't even try fighting yesterday because he was fighting Faber and he got his ass choked out. Uh, the one thing I do want to say about that fight that is of noteworthy, uh, so people I was watching the fight with, this is kind of the discussion we had. Is there any more way that you can more severely dominate a man than to jump on his back, rear naked choke him, and then after the ref calls it, to stick your arms in the air while you're still on his back. I'm like, for Christ's sakes, can you get down before you celebrate? <laughs> you know, you're at, in effect, you're making this guy give you a goddamn piggyback ride while you're. He looked like Men. Menjivar looked like he was Uriah's corner man. For Christ's sakes, <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ, let let get down before you celebrate. So, uh, you know. It's whatever, but it's just, I, I got a it. kick out of that. Yeah, it was so, good. So here's what, I, here's what I want to propose to you. Um, the top five, I'm going to count. Okay, so the, the situation in the Bantamweight division is this. Hannah Burrell is the interim champion. So while when you look at the rankings, we talked about this before. Dominic Cruz is the champion, but Hannah Burrell is the number one contender, even though he's a champion. So for me, the top we'll go with the top six because of Hannah Burrell. So the top five would be minus Cruz and Burrell. Faber, uh, Manny McDonald, Eddie Wineland, Brad Pickett, and Raphael Sunsau. Now, while I like Uriah Faber fighting Win Wineland or Pickett, how about him fighting Mayday McDonald? Where do you stand on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to. I'd like to see that uh, him fighting McDonald. I think that would be uh, a good matchup for both of them. <clears throat> I don't know if if McDonald. You know, after seeing the last fight with McDonald, I don't know if he's really ready. He's got to go back in the gym and, and pick up some new. Uh, you know, get some skill set that he's kind of lacking and, and build it up. So I don't know if his 
if his camp would allow that to happen because it's somebody you don't want to walk in there, you're out of favor uh, because you're just going to get tossed again. So uh, I would like to see that fight, but I don't know if, if his camp would allow that. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd see a, a, a picket or a Wagman fight. That would, that would be good. So of the, of the three, what's your preference? Uh, For all parties involved, McDonald, Faber, everybody, what's the fight you? What's the fight that A you'd like to see and B you think's best for everybody? I think it would be Wineland, I think. Uh, I think that would, you know, we've seen Pickett, but, you know, Pickett had a couple of losses in his uh, in his last few fights. So I don't, I would have to say with Wineland because I think that would give him the most competition, give him favor one more fight and, and then fight for the title uh, after that if, if he could win. I agree. I like that too. I mean, I, I do want to see the Mayday McDonald fight, but I want to see uh, Uriah get in. The thing I like about the Mayday McDonald fight is I know Mayday is going to go after him. And, uh, you know, Uriah, Uriah's good when he has to think on his feet and he has to move and he has to. The only problem is that if McDonald puts one on him, he's going out. Although I don't know. I don't think, I don't think Brown knocked him out, did he? No. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, if, if, he, can, if he can stand in there, but Uriah, Brown did break Listen, his rib. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I'm saying. That fight would have been a different if, if your uh, favor didn't break his rib because it wasn't that much of a dominating fight. Because you know, when we went back and watched it again uh, – it was it was closer than that, and he had a broken rib too. So I think there could have been a different outcome if if he would have been full healthy going through it. Well, but in fairness, the, the rib was broken in the fight. So when you say Uriah Faber broke his right. rib, right, right, and, right. and, and Burrell broke his rib, his rib. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, I would like to see that fight again without Uriah Faber having a broken rib. So, all right, so let's move on to the next fight. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put a nice. I'm gonna go get myself a fork and a knife and eat either some crow or some shit, whatever, however you want to put it, because I said Court Mickey and Josh Neer should not be on the main card. Brendan Schaub and LeVar Johnson uh, should be. And once again, I, I am con I'm the number one guy to criticize these people for doing Joe Silva's job. I tried to do it, and I was wrong. The Brendan Schaub LeVar Johnson fight was horrible, and the Court McGee josh Neer, while it went to a decision, and it was a clean sweep for Court McGee, it was still a better fight. So talk to me about this fight. Man, Court McGee came in throwing more bombs than I've seen in a while. Well, not bombs. I should say just say punches because that kid, like I think he was probably still waking up and he was punching in his sleep last night. That's how many punches he threw. Uh, he looked good. He dropped weight, you know. And I, I, I tweeted last night. Let's see how that cardio works out uh, in the later rounds, man. But he looked fresh. He, he said he didn't have that much trouble uh, dropping weight. He looked fresh in it, and uh, he came out and, and dominated, and dominated near. I mean, from opening bell to the end. Uh, Near had some good, good instances in there in the second and the third, but court was just all over him, man. It was a, uh, it was a good stand-up brawl. It was, and the interesting thing about fighting is that you know it, it's weird, you know, that you you get to where you figure out all these all this training, all these complicated things, and it's really a, a um, I'm I'm kind of putting the finishes on the, the fighter's mind by Sam Sheridan right now, and I I need to. I'm going to try and incorporate more of that into the podcast in the, in the coming months and delve into that more. But it, it is interesting that the parts of a fighter's psyche that you have to get into to tap into where they need to be. Sometimes you need to make them a more cerebral fighter. And sometimes in the case with what Court McGee said after the fight, he said, I got some of the best advice I've ever gotten. The guy, they told me just to hit him as many times as I can without stopping. And you know, just hit him in the face as many times as you can. And that's what a guy like Court McGee needs sometimes you know sometimes fighters need for you to just tell them to get out of their own way and just go in there focus on landing land as much as you can and 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 see where that gets you and that's what court mcgee did last night and that's what ultimately got him the decision over a game and uh you know he's a josh Neer's a veteran dude he's not somebody you're going to take out easily he's been around for a while and uh and, and court mcgee looked very impressive you know me and, and decisions man I, I actually tweeted out over the weekend this may be our new uh our, our new motto around here, although uh, on the heels of what we talked about with Adam Martin uh, in our last podcast, I don't want to get too much into this, but I think the new uh, the new uh, motto in the UFC might be decisions get dismissals. So uh, I think that that's uh, the way they're trending, and you know you don't want to you don't want to go to the to, to the judges ever. But Cormac, you looked impressive, man. Thirty twenty seven across the board. Is, yeah, it was is dominant. It? Yeah, speaking of dominant. Cause I don't really want to get into what's next for Court McGee yet, cause he's he's a little he's a little green. Um, well, that's his first fight. That's his first fight dropping to 170. 
So I mean, what's next for him? I mean, he can go about three different routes right now for what next for that kid. And, you know, he's still going to have to build up. He's going to have to get on his eating regimen. He's going to have to maintain that weight that he can drop easier in the next fight because his next opponent's going to be a little more high calorie than Josh Neer was. So he's going right. to do that. So he has, some, uh, he has some work to do. So, yeah, there's about three different ways they could use him. And uh, But I'm interested to see, man, because he looked pretty strong at 170. So I'm interested to see what this kid can do in that weight class. But that's what it's about too, because you know, not to not to make a, a comparison to the two, but you know, some some casual fans out there, or just maybe fans that aren't as smart as they should probably be, would ask, uh, why why is a guy like Court McGee still at 170 and John Fitch got cut? And like we said on the other day, and what Dana said, what Court McGee is bringing to the table is different than what John Fitch is bringing to the table right now. Yeah, is he is Court McGee a better fighter than John Fitch right now? No, but Court McGee's going in one direction, and John, John you know, Court McGee know. and John. He looked like a, looked like it last night. That's true. He did. He was he was busy, and I don't know. I, you, you kind of do wonder if if John Fitch and Court McGee fought, what would happen? But you know, you know, everybody ultimately in the UFC in each division is on a ladder, and the question is, are you going up it or are you going down it? And right now, Court McGee's going up it, and John Fitch is going down it. Yeah. All right. Speaking of a guy, two guys that are going in opposite directions in their career potentially. Robbie Lawler fought Josh Koscheck, so while I have my plate of crow in front of me, I'll go ahead and eat some for Robbie Lawler. Uh, he, he made short work of, jo of uh, Josh Koscheck, speeding him with punches. There was some controversy. If you, uh, you know, people on the internet, even Joe Rogan to a certain extent, felt this fight was stopped a little prematurely. Uh, what did you think, and what's your thoughts on the fight? No, man, I didn't, I didn't think it was stopped early. I think he was out, uh, and Robbie just kept on hitting him. And, and, and you know how... We've seen the old, I'm going to knock you out and then wake your ass back up and knock you out again. So that's kind of what it was. Robbie jump, jumped off over, jumped on him, and, and he got when he, once he got him down, it was the end of the story. Uh, listen, Robbie has some heavy-ass hands. They were, remember, just like they said yesterday, I mean, they were thinking this kid was going to be the Mike Tyson when he came in the UFC at, uh, years ago. I mean, he, the kid can, has knockout power in both hands, and when he puts those gloves on you, it's going to fucking hurt. And last night, Cause fell all of it because he got his got his ass knocked out and and he even looked up uh, even after the fight you could tell Josh Josh was looking up at, at the at the screen wondering what the fuck happened to him so you know he was out so uh, I mean that was it uh, Robbie came in I, I'm glad to see he came back you know I'm not a huge fan of Josh Koscheck but uh, listen I'm glad to see Robbie came over and and uh, kind of tore him up. Do you think every discussion about Kosh Josh Koscheck starts with someone saying, I'm not a huge fan of Josh Koscheck, but it I don't know if be. there are any huge fans. I think Josh Koscheck is the only one that's a huge fan of Josh Koscheck. <laughs> um, I, so here's my thing with this fight. Um, and I talked about this last night with people I was watching the fight with. I love when a fighter, let's say you get hit with six straight shots, and a fighter goes, you know, I wasn't out. You know, you start complaining and all this other shit. And it's like, dude. You got hit with six shots. If I didn't step in, you would have got hit with seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Like I'm the reason why it stopped at six. Okay, you're not the reason why it stopped at six. I'm the reason why. And if I gotta stop it at six and you don't, that's why the fucking fight's over. Okay, so don't tell me a lot. A lot of times, man, fights and if guys got their hands up and they're trying to like you can tell when a guy's trying to stop some shit, and you can tell when a guy's just like you know hoping it someone stops it. You know, and there's yeah, a big like difference. Those guys that are, are reaching up and, and they grab the ref because they think the ref's the fighter. And yeah. You're trying to pick the ref on the double leg. <laughs> so yeah. you know you're out. And exactly, <laughs> like they said after the fight, you know, how, how Dana said that uh, Josh was, even you said it, Josh was looking up at the, at the monitor trying to figure out what happened, you know. It's, it's the old joke we made it a thousand times. If a fight's over and you ask the referee what happened, you fucking know what happened. You got knocked That's out. Right. <laughs> That's the right. only answer in a cage to what happened is you got knocked out. That's yeah. the only answer. Or choked out. Yeah, no one's ever said, what happened? Oh, you knocked him out, and then you fainted. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's never happened. No. Nope. So stop asking. Okay, so uh, now, while Robbie Lawler looked impressive, let's talk about two guys who together looked impressive, Dennis Bermudez and Matt Grice. Dennis Bermudez and Matt Grice, and I reserve dude, this. That was a fight. Dude, I reserve this term. You know, because you and I are both veterans, we've both served. I reserve this term for special fights and special fights only. These two boys went to fucking war last night. And, I mean, they just made a decision. Bermuda said in the post-fight, uh, well, let, 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 me, let me just tell you how uh, 
the scoring went. It was a uh, split decision, 29-28 all around. Obviously, two of them for Bermudez and one of them for Price. Um, but these guys, Bermudez said after the fight, I was getting hit enough that I just decided I might as well hit back. <laughs> and, I mean, that's fair. I mean, he got dropped. He got folded. You know, yeah, and you know did. that. You know yeah. when you when you know when you get that hit that folds your ass up like a damn uh like a beach chair and uh, that's what happened to Ramudis. He got folded like a beach chair and next thing you know, he recovered. And I, I even tweeted, I told my buddy, uh, who likes uh, old school hip hop like I do, I said I had to reach into my damn bag of tricks of old school hip hop and to, to make a description for Dennis Ramudis, I tweeted that his part pumps nitro, you know, from uh, the old Ice T days because yeah. dude to get folded like that and then to come up and that son of a bitch never stopped moving forward, TJ. He no. never stopped pushing the pushing the action. He got dropped and he was getting busted. And the I guy I was watching the fight today. Huh? I wonder if he even remembers the fight today. I dude, there was times uh, you know, Muniz looked like he was on, you know, in La La Land in the first round and, dude, and, and that Yeah. And second and third round, that's what Grice looked like. Bryce yeah. was there was shots of the camera just right in Grice's face, and he was just like, boom, and then the, the punches just kept keep coming. I mean, these guys went to absolute war, and they were throwing those punches where they missed, but had they landed, you'd be like, Jesus Christ, that guy would have been in the hospital had that landed. Anyway, talk to me about this fight. I've said, I've said plenty. Look, I want you to get, uh, you know, pull your thesaurus out and give me some, uh, <laughs> some adjectives. Listen, the, these two... These both of them, I mean, even though uh, Ramirez has won, listen, Grice won too because putting a fight like that in heart and standing up and taking a beating, you know, giving a beating and then taking a beating, uh, both of these two guys uh, won last night. And, uh, man, I don't even know how to explain it. Like you said it best, they went to war, man. They were landing shots up against the cage. I mean, I swear to God, Grice in the third round was out at least three times and came back and was fighting. Like his eyes rolled back in the back of his head and he fucking still was swinging. I mean, I don't, I don't get it. The dude had, he wasn't going down, and uh, you couldn't put him down last night. I don't think two fucking Mack trucks could have put those kids down last night. So, uh, you know, Bermuda's got the win. He'll move up a little bit, but Grice. He didn't fall much because he put on a damn good fight and one on one card too. You know, and these guys were the were the guys that kind of said to Dana on the heels of all these cuts. You know, I, and, and they're right there. You know, I mean, I'm not saying either one of these guys would have got cut, but they're right. They're they're guys that would get cut if they if they didn't look impressive. And they they almost there. I mean, this is an early contender for fight of the year. Yeah. I mean, th these guys really said to Dana, pretty much. You know, I I dare I fucking dare you to cut me. Like after this fight, and they, I mean they went in there and they went to complete battle. It was the fight of the night, um, and and deservedly so. So you know me, man. I don't like to I don't like to really talk about what the future holds for the middle, you know, the middle contenders kind of. But um, you know these guys did something that you you don't always do when you're a uh, kind of a middling uh, contender. And and what that was was they went out there. And they just put on an absolute war, and oh, yeah. that was and, a good fight, man. Yeah, it's a fight that you're gonna remember. Yep. And even though the, even though someday you're not gonna, you know, remember Dennis Bermudez or Matt Grice necessarily for their careers, you'll always remember the night they got together and put a, and put a war on for you, yeah. or you should. And Absolutely. there's some fights out there that, that just always live up to the to the to the uh, to the billing and, and 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 kind of carve out a little piece of history for them. And last night they, on a very historic night. They carved out a little piece of history for themselves. Yeah. Okay, um, I just want to hit a few things real quick, and then we'll finish strong. Um, I don't know the exact particulars on the numbers. I'm sorry I don't have those, but the gate was was, was good. Dana was proud of the gate. Uh, the attendance was good. Sellout uh, for attendance, and, and the gate was, was up right about where he wanted. I think it was around 1.5, yeah, if, uh, if I'm guessing. So yeah. now in terms of what uh, bonuses were. That's, that's what I'm interested to see. Well, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because the, the largest pay-per-view buy ever in women in combat sports history. Now, they're not even going to judge it based on MMA. It's women in combat sports. I'm wearing my Ali Frazier fight, uh, my Roots of Fight shirt today because the greatest fight uh, in terms of women's combat sports history was when their daughters fought. Ali Frazier was 125,000 buys. And Dana caught a little bit of hell in the scrum because he was saying that uh, that's the biggest record and he thinks we're going to shatter it. And someone, I think it was John Morgan from MMA Junkie, 
well, I'm not crazy about. He said, uh, well, it's hard to compare them, them to you because you guys are on a different level. And Dana's like, listen, it's a record. We're going for the record. So, um, very historic night. Pay-per-view bonds will be interesting to see. I think it'll, I really do think it'll be up there. Uh, in terms of the bonuses, it was 50000 apiece. All around, knockout of the night was Robbie Lawler, uh, deservedly so. Fight of the night was Bermudez and Grice, deservedly so. And uh, submission of the night was, um, I think it was Kenny Robertson who submitted to Brock Jardine. So uh, those were all yeah. very deserving. So, yeah, to go ahead and put up, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to finish strong. Before we do that, I want you to go ahead and uh, – and just take a, a minute or two here to just kind of uh, give your thoughts as the card on a whole and, and how this moves us forward. Listen, 157 was a historic night uh, for women and women's MMA, and it lived up to the hype. And the undercard uh, was just as good, except for the Machida fight. But, hey, you know, you can't have all of them. You can't have a perfect run, right? Uh, but overall, it was great. We saw what women can bring to the sport. We saw what women... Uh, with a lot of stress and, and put on their shoulders of these two ladies did, they came and performed like true champions, both of them. Uh, I thought it was great. I can't wait to see them fight again, either one of them. And, uh, and I think they can be able to carry the weight moving forward. Uh, it's a new realm of uh, MMA. We're seeing it with youngsters growing up, and now we're seeing it with women. And, uh, and I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the ride. I agree, and I think that what women did especially was they made it known that because with any minority – who's making their way and, 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 you know, kind of getting themselves into a certain sport or whatever it is, uh, walk of life, business, they always know that they have to do it better than the people that are already in the establishment. So, you know, Ronda Rousey and Liz Carmouche couldn't have fought the same fight that Dan Henderson and Lota Machida fought last night. They couldn't do it because it would just be, it would destroy the, it would destroy the movement, it would destroy their cause, and, and they just couldn't do it. And the thing you got to like about Ronda Rousey is she's fully tuned into that. She knows what she has to do, and, and she goes out there and does it. And some of the criticisms she got last night, which I thought was unfair, is they're starting to call her a little bit of a one-trick pony. And they're saying that she just goes in there and arm bars people. And, and my problem with that is, one, that's a very difficult thing to do, to arm bar somebody. And for them to know that you're going to try and arm bar them and still do it, it's very difficult. And my other criticism of, of that criticism is that if, people were, if someone was going in there knocking guys out, you wouldn't necessarily call them one trick pony. You'd call them like you know, just just a tornado or a, a I hurricane. I have to jump in here for this one. Go ahead, Johnny Hendricks. That's all I have to say about one trick ponies, because that's what he does. He knocks people out with that one hand, and he's done it the last few fights. So we we're not going to call him a one trick pony. So let's block off uh, Ronda Rousey. Yeah, no, so you're right. You're absolutely right. There's no criticism of Johnny Hendricks for that either. You know, they don't they don't look at Johnny Hendricks if he's not a well-rounded guy. Okay, let's go ahead and put, and, uh, and put an end to this bad boy and finish strong. I'll finish strong first, and I want to. I tweeted this out last night, but I want to go ahead and say it as well. Um, my concern with the women fighters because of Ronda Rousey's personality, and uh, you know, if I could speak to anyone in particular, it would be Misha Tate, but the girls as a whole. I want them to understand one thing. You know, Ronda Rousey talks a lot of shit. Ronda Rousey has a lot of fun. And Ronda Rousey may have a healthy ego and all of those things. But what those girls need to understand is they, they can want to go in there and fight her. And they can want to go in there and take her head off. They can want to go in there and do all those things, and they have the right to do that. What they need to be very careful with is understanding that Ronda Rousey is going to make them rich. She's the reason why they're in the UFC. She's the reason why they're going to be in the UFC for a while. And she's the reason why when they fight, they're going to get paid. It's all because of Ronda Rousey. So I have no problem with you wanting to defeat her and doing all the things that come with hyping a fight. If I were you guys, I'd be very careful about being like overly critical about her when it comes to things outside of the cage. I think that's very unfair, and I think that they all owe a real, real debt of gratitude to her. They don't have to. I'm not a fan of somebody, you know, kissing someone's ass. They don't have to do that. I would just be real careful with being overly critical about her in the public when she's doing so much for their cause. All right, you're up, my man. Finish strong. Jose, Jose, I don't care if you call yourself Jose, Aldo, <laughs> you do not dictate who you're going to fight, especially s somebody of Showtime Pettis' caliber that's going to come down 
and compete for the belt and puts you to the limit. Uh, you're not Joe Silva. You're the champion. And UFC has every right to put any competitor that they feel is fit enough to compete in that ring with you or in that octagon with you. So take a back seat. Enjoy your championship. Because if you don't, the next time you come up to the UFC office, it's going to be to be stripped of that belt because you won't fight somebody. So what I want to say is it's just like Anderson Silva. You know, I've been on this tirade. I, I, don't, I don't know what's up with these guys when they become champions. Uh, but their obligation to the UFC and to us as fans is to defend that belt against the proper one, two, three, top five competitors in that weight division. And if he wants to drop down and compete, he's a number one and two and, uh in the 155, so if he wants to drop to 145, let's do it. Shut your mouth. Go in there and show that he doesn't deserve it by whooping his ass. Don't tell us that he doesn't deserve it. I agree. I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, you're right, man. Jose Aldo needs to just do – do. Not, I don't like the whole saying of do what you're told, but I think – I, you know, my big question here would be the, the, the uh, how much of this is, is being affected by Ed Source and his – Connection to Anderson Silva, obviously, but you know Anderson Silva's connection to Aldo, Black House. I mean, Ed Sore is, is someone that that you know is one of those managers that kind of pulls some shit. And I wonder if like all of the branches of Anderson Silva, um, if Jose Aldo is the one that's kind of saying, you know, I'm not going to do things here. I'm a champ. I'm going to decide when and where I want to fight, and this and that and the other. So I don't know. It's a theory of mine. We talked many times about how I'm a conspiracy theorist. So. uh I think that I'm wondering if the Ed Source just kind of sets the table for this sort of thing. All right, so uh, that's going to put an end to this episode of the Hot Cage Podcast. Uh, there will be another Hot Cage Podcast for your listening pleasure before you know it. Again, we'd like to thank CageWall.com for sponsoring us. Uh, the next fight up will be of significance at least. UFC on Fuel TV 8. It will be this weekend, March 2nd. Anderson Silva, oh, excuse me, uh, Vanderlei Silva is fighting Brian Stan. Mark Hunt's fighting Stefan Struve. Takanor Gomi's fighting Diego Sanchez. Hector Lombard's fighting Yushin Okami. I mean, for that to be the top four fights of a Fuel TV card, lets you know that when Dana White tells you he's 100 fighters heavy, he ain't fucking around. Because if you can put those four fights on Fuel TV, then you're heavy. So, uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, these guys need to start uh, fighting hard and, and knowing that uh, they might get clipped soon, if not. So, before you know it, we'll be on here. We're going to bring more people on the podcast. We're going to... Uh, give you guys a lot of stuff. Thanks to Cage Wall again. Thanks to my tag team partner as always, TJ Craig. We'll see you next week. Uh, actually, later this week. And uh, as always, keep your chin down and your hands up. This is the Hot Cage Podcast.